Tread Softly. Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then ye are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Amen. History in the News for the week of April 19 to 25. April 19, 1587, English Admiral Sir Francis Drake entered Cadiz Harbor and sank the Spanish fleet, an action he referred to as singeing the king of Spain's beard. And, of course, at that time, the Spanish were also very, a very powerful naval power. Long before uh, the North American continent was known, or well-known very much, uh, they knew it was there by that time, but just barely, they didn't really appreciate the size of what was there, and the, the English and the Spanish and the French uh, as well were there very much on the coast of Europe, their navies just beginning to grow to what became a very strong and powerful rivalry. April 19, 1713, Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI issued the Pragmatic Sanction. 
giving women the rights of succession to Habsburg possessions. And the Habsburgs were instrumental the family, uh, originally Swiss, uh, who became very many of the so-called Holy Roman Emperors. We'll thank God for that. How, uh, in fact, the Holy Roman Empire was, in fact, German, as we mentioned many, many times. And the reason we mention it over and over is because it's not done yet. It's going to happen one more time. The great beast power uh, may well actually be a Habsburg, or certainly somewhere along that line, no pun intended. April 19, 1839, the treaty ratified to form two separate kingdoms of Belgium and the Netherlands. The Treaty of London was signed, established recognition of the Kingdom of Belgium by all the states of Europe. And before that time, of course, there was no Belgium. It was the Netherlands, all the United Provinces. Um, and it split, more or less. The northern part became what is known today as the Netherlands, and the southern provinces became Belgium. And they split primarily because of religion. The southern provinces remained Catholic, and the northern provinces uh, became Protestant. And my mother's side of the family, she was born there uh, at a small town not far from the border. She was actually, uh, in that time, uh, could have been... Either one, actually, but as it turns out, she ended up in Belgium, or she, the family lived in that village for centuries, and she became Belgium rather than Dutch or Netherlands, although the lang language. I did some family history uh, research years ago, and I wrote to the town hall where my mother was born there. Uh, she moved here when, the, when she was eight years old, not long after. She was born literally in the middle of the First World War, both in terms of time and place, and after the war they came here when she was eight years old, but I wrote to the town hall in which she was born looking for family genealogical information. And the lady in charge of the records there, that she didn't have anything, but she knew of a Roman Catholic monk in a nearby monastery who was keeping genealogical records. And she recognized the name because his name, his last name was the same. So she gave um, my letter to him, and as it turns out, he was uh, what we would call here, they, they counted differently here, like we say, second and third or fourth, fifth, six cousins, whereas over there it's counted, as they say, by degrees, but he turns out he was my fifth or sixth cousin. You know, it gets pretty far away from that. And he had records going back from my mother's line all the way back to the 1500s. So I really hit the jackpot as far as family history goes, uh, finding him. And he was happy to find me because he had very little information of those who had came to North America and I was happy to provide that to him. He sort of traded, but I got I got the better of the deal because I, you know, all I had was from from the 1920s on, and whereas he had like from 1500s. So I knew my family through my mother's side uh, back 400 years. But he was happy too because he had nothing for those who came across the Atlantic um, here. Not only uh, the Canadian ones, but the American ones as well because when they came over, there were two brothers, my grandfather and his brother, the two families, and they got here just in time for the Great Depression. They, they, amazingly, they, they survived the First World War. They came here, and then just as the Great Depression was starting, and as it happens, my grandfather was a farmer. He was able to get work, whereas his brother was a machinist, and he didn't. He just There were factories where you know, the jobs were very rare, scarce. But he heard that there was a, a farm equipment manufacturer, um, John Deere, in Illinois that was hiring machinists and he went there and settled there he lived the rest of his life he lived to be 80 some almost 90 years old uh, retired and uh, his son and children and grandchildren were born there ironically the one in Illinois uh, his son went back he was in the US Army when the town that was liberated uh, from the Nazis in Belgium the, town, the whole hometown he was actually one of the soldiers who went in there and helped liberate it at that time. So it was sort of ironic. But I had all the information, not only for the Canadian branch, but for the American one as well. The ones in Illinois and the ones in Maine, the ones in Pennsylvania. So he was happy to get the information. I was just as happy to get, get you know, what I found. Because it was like 400 years worth on one, one thing. It's interesting. They, they never really moved very far. The ones that stayed in Belgium, I mean, it's like... Probably in 400 years they might have moved 30 miles. It's a very small country as well, but right around in, in northern Belgium. It's an interesting study, but for that time they were, prior to 1839, they were Dutch, as in Netherlands, and then they became Belgian. It's amazing how that worked. April 19, 1861, President Lincoln ordered the blockade of Confederate ports. 
and April 26, 1865, John Wilkes Booth, age 27, assassin of Abraham Lincoln, died in a shootout with federal troops 11 days after Lincoln's death. I saw uh, an interesting uh, article in the news yesterday. A U.S. researcher, medical researcher, wants to do a DNA test of, apparently there is some... Uh, a pillowcase that was used that was wrapped around the president's head after he was shot. They have his DNA from that pillowcase. It was preserved uh, because this particular researcher believes that uh, Lincoln was dying of cancer uh, at the time he was shot. There was the unexplained weight loss. He was getting very gaunt. Uh, he always was sort of, from pictures, all the pictures I've ever seen of him, sort of lean, but in his last months he was dramatically losing weight, according to this researcher. And there were other signs that he had a, a very rare form of cancer, and he was in fact dying when he was assassinated. And, and he tried to explain some of the things that Lincoln said, visions of death and so on, that he was actually thinking he knew he was ill and perhaps dying from that, and it was not widely known. And they don't know if they're going to let him do the DNA testing. Apparently they can find out from that whether he had this very rare form of cancer. So it's interesting, after so long like that they can test and, and find that out. April 19, 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt issued a proclamation removing the U.S. from the gold standard, and a lot of other countries did the same, in effect saying our money's worth what it is because we say so, rather than having gold to back it up with. A lot of countries went that way, and perhaps a lot of a lot of people are still saying that, are saying now, particularly, that had the gold standard been maintained, you couldn't have the economic problems the world is having right now because it wouldn't be based on nothing. Governments couldn't just print billions of dollars of money based on nothing more than their word that it's going to be good, based all on credit and debt and everything else. The gold standard would have prevented that. And interestingly, people are buying, individuals are buying gold now because the money, uh, they have fears of the value of their money when in fact the money itself used to be backed by gold. It's amazing how common sense seems to come around, even though when governments don't seem to pay much attention to it anymore. April 19, 1967, the unmanned U.S. spacecraft Surveyor 3 landed on the moon. And it's interesting, you'll see this in a number of examples of this. When During the space race, there's a number of examples of it, when either one or the other did something, some advance, some great accomplishment, the other would take that date and target that particular date to to up to do something more, sort of like to overshadow it. And there's a number of examples of that. But see, this example where the first U.S. the unmanned spacecraft landed on the moon. What happened on that same date, four years later? The Soviet Union launched the first orbiting space station. Now, of all the you know they they could have chosen practically any date, but they chose the same date in order to do that. It's just one upmanship. It's interesting how they do that. And there are a number of examples of it. Actually, April 19, 1993, David Koresh, a Waco, Texas religious cult leader, and over 80 of his followers were killed after the FBI invaded the so-called Branch Davidian compound and caused a devastating fire. And, of course, there's many controversies about that, who actually started the fire and so on, and why they attacked and so on. And some uh, believe there was a connection to the Koresh incident and the bombing of Oklahoma City, which occurred the same day, two years later, April 19, 1995, 169 people were killed by a terrorist bombing of a federal building in Oklahoma City. Uh, some believe that those were occurred, and actually that was the worst, before 9-11, was the worst terrorist act in the history of the United States, and it was done by an American who was apparently, uh, had been a member of the U.S. military in the, for the liberation of Kuwait. So it's interesting. I, as I understand, there was a number of the Homeland Security leader um, leaked a document saying that there's that concern again that many people returning from the war uh, may be lured into the so-called terrorist sort of activities. They're worried about that. And there was a lot of um, outrage about that, a suggestion that people would be doing that. But she did um, anger, um, understandably so, anger members of the U.S. military because she sort of made them out to be potential terrorists, you know, the very people who were defending the country in the war on terrorism, that she would say that they're going to come home and be terrorists, so you can understand how they would be upset. 
She got uh, she made a comment here too. It's this this apparently it's just a myth that just cannot die. Uh, she made the statement, and this is the head of the Homeland Security for the U.S. She made that statement again, and it's been proven dead false for years. Uh, she said that the 9/11 terrorists came from Canada or came through Canada on their way from the Middle East, and that was proven uh, dead wrong right from the beginning. They came in directly uh, in direct flights from the Middle East and landed in the U.S. They None of them came through Canada, and yet it was very surprising. That was only yesterday she said it again, and the um, the Canadian ambassador protested, and then she said she, she didn't really mean what she said. She meant something else kind of a thing, but it's, it's really bizarre how that lie, because I think it's beyond just a myth. I think people know better. I mean, the truth is there for anyone who wants to open their eyes, but it just seems to be perpetuated by people who who want to believe it, or or maybe who want others to believe it, maybe that's it, because, you know, but it, it's a fraud, it's not true. They came directly from the Middle East, they were allowed in by U.S. Customs, some of them even with student permits issued by the U.S. government to so they could train to fly airliners at U.S. white schools. I mean, on top of that, maybe that's the reason they want to point the finger at somebody else, just to, to, to cover up or put up a smoke screen over that reality. But you know, that wasn't our fault. Uh, our only connection actually to 9 11 is when immediately as it happened, the uh, U.S. airspace was sh- shut down. Planes over the Atlantic were not allowed in. So most of them ended up in Canada. Otherwise, they would have crashed into the Atlantic Ocean from running out of fuel. The U.S. shut down the airspace. No one was going to come in. So they had to come here or crash into the ocean. You know, thousands of innocent people and uh, by the way an American airliners surely it was a very chaotic time Never, no one knew what was going on whether there were going to be more attacks so much of the the safety of shutting down the airspace was justified the thing is there were hundreds if not thousands of people in the air and they couldn't turn back and not allowing them to land put their lives in danger you know it could have happened and it's just like no you can't come here American pilots flying American airlines requesting permission to land at American airports were turned away. So, and you know, if they could have went in anyway, would they not have done it? Surely they must have thought that the chance of being shot down was very real, or else they would have kept on going anyway. I mean, if I was a pilot of an airliner, and I was low on fuel, and I had a choice of flying to my home airport, where I was supposed to be going in my own country, or putting it into the ocean, if that's the only two choices I had, uh, I would take my chances going home if I knew I wasn't going to get shot down. Unless there's some other country with an airport who said, come on in. We're not going to shoot at you. So, And that's what happened. And a lot of people who were just on their way home, a lot of them were just uh, students and just regular people. They didn't have a lot of money for hotels and things like that. So regular folks here put them up. My sister actually had uh, four Americans in her home for a a few days so they could could get home. You know, the death toll from 9-11 would have been far higher because Bush would have let those airliners crash into the ocean. Airliners, you know, they only carry enough fuel for one direction. They can't just turn around and fly back to Europe. If they're past the halfway point, they've got to land in, in somewhere in North America, whether it be on land or in the ocean. So, as far as Bush was concerned, those airliners, most of which were American, could have either been shot down by American fighter aircraft under Bush's order, or crashed into the ocean. That was the choice they had. But fortunately, the airports from all the way from Halifax and Newfoundland, uh, all the way as far as uh, as Quebec, where my sister lives, took them in. The airports were jammed by those airliners that Bush would have let crash into the ocean. So... When you hear 9-11 things, all the terrorists came through Canada, I really wish they, they would get their facts straight before saying something like that. Because, you know, they, they'll say it, and a million, millions of people will hear them, but millions of people will never hear their correction of it. And so the myth just goes on and on and on, and people should know better by now. April 21, 753 B.C., according to the historian Varro, the city of Rome was founded on this date by Romulus. And who knows, might be true, might not be. There's a lot of mythology there. Who knows? April 21, 1836, the Mexicans were defeated by the Texans at the Battle of San Joaquinto. 
thus ensuring Texan independence. And if you're from Texas, I may have said that wrong. Yeah, Kinto, I probably did. April 21, 1918, German flying ace, Baron Manfred von Richthofen, age 26, known as the Red Baron, was shot down and killed over the western front of France during a dogfight with Canadian fighter pilot Arthur Roy Brown of Carlton Place, Ontario. Brown received the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Red Baron named for his Red Fokker triplane, shot down 80 Allied airplanes, 79 British, 1 Belgian, during World War I. He was killed after he chased another Canadian fighter plane which had jammed guns two miles behind enemy lines. He was killed after being fired upon by Brown and Australian ground troops. The next day, the Red Baron was buried by the Canadians and Australians with full military honors. So as that song goes, 80 men died trying to end that spree. That part's correct, but Snoopy didn't get him. We did. April 22, 1915, the Battle of Ypres in Belgium began. It was the first major battle for Canadian troops in World War I. The Germans released chlorine gas, the first use, forcing the unprepared French army to retreat. The first Canadian division and British troops rushed in to halt the German advance, took a week of fierce fighting and counterattacks involving more gas before the German attack was brought to a halt. So the World War, First World War was primitive in terms of fire, the weaponry, mostly just rifles and artillery, but it was certainly bloody. And at that time, 19, it went from 1914 to 1918, the United States, I think, as we mentioned last week, did not enter the war until 1917. This was two years after the Battle of Ypres in Belgium. So it was like it had been going on for quite a long time before that. In the Second World War as well, the bloody wars that humans have inflicted upon ourselves. Of course, if you add up all the little ones, the death tolls probably are far more than World War One and Two. if you were to add them all together. The difference, though, in modern warfare is that the civilians are targeted more. Whereas back in the old days, it used to be primarily armies fighting each other. Now it's a matter of bombing uh, civilian cities. April 22, 1955, the U.S. Congress ordered all U.S. coins to bear the motto, In God We Trust. April 24, 1992, scientists working with the Kobig satellite announced that their data showed hot and cold ripples in space, which indicated proof of the Big Bang. Stephen Hawking called it, this, called it the discovery of the century, if not all time. Project leader George Smoot said, if you are religious, it's like looking at God. So they came pretty close to admitting it there, didn't they? People who believe in the Big Bang. And the Big Bang Bang could could very well have happened. It's an, it's an unfortunate term, but it's just as creation, expansion of the universe that's been measured, that's actually happening. And what they just can't get around, though, the fact that in order for the Big Bang to happen, the laws of physics had to have been there before. They could not have been a part of the Big Bang because the Big Bang you can't. It could not have happened if they did not have something to set it off. That is to say, the laws of physics, physics are there before. So, and there have been many other fanciful ideas that the universe may have been created many times and just sort of expands and then snaps back and then expands again, expands again back and forth, on and on and on. Maybe someday we'll know. But right now, I don't think our minds, carnal human minds, could understand anyway. April 25, 1859, construction of the Suez Canal began. Uh, that through that part of area was actually where the Exodus crossed, the Israelites crossed in the Exodus. They did could not have crossed the Red Sea. That The terminology used there, I will put the link on for that study, also included areas far north of that. And if you look at simply what is said, uh, they did not cross far south. There are other lowlands in there, lakes in there, uh, which were connected actually by the Suez Canal. If you follow the route of the Suez Canal up from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, you are almost surely finding whatever water it was that was crossed because those lakes and lowlands in there. I will put the link on for that. Again, how sometimes modern developments are sort of mapping things that happened in the past because they take advantage of natural things that have existed since the most ancient of times, including back to the Exodus. History in the news. Our 
question this week may well be uh, also considered a technical note, but it's actually both, so we'll just go ahead with it anyway. Uh, last Sabbath, we had a server outage. Uh, rather rare. It doesn't happen very often. One of the first things I do in the morning is to check uh, that everything's working. And lo and behold, I found the, uh, the dreaded page not found when I clicked on Daily Bible Study, which is rare, as I said. Uh, but I, I then check another server that is in the same building. That It's not on the same server as Daily Bible Study. It has its own server. But I know another website that's on a different server in that same building, and it didn't work either. So that told me the building was down that all of the servers most likely were down then. I do have a, a monitoring service, uh, which actually they are uh, located in Europe, but they uh, check the uh, Daily Bible Study server every five minutes, just an automated test, and if it's down, they send me uh, both an email and a text message to my cell phone. The only problem with that is uh, if my server's down, my email is as well, so obviously I won't get the email. And the other thing is that uh, my cell phone, uh, I've read things about the nasty things you can get from the signals uh, in it, from it. I just think they don't really know as much as perhaps they're going to know in 10 or 15 years. So I don't carry it turned on. I have a cell phone with me all the time, but it's it's turned off. I just uh, use it for outgoing calls, or I'll turn it on. If I'm expecting a call specifically, I'll have it on then. But um, for the most part, it's it's off. So I'll... The text message uh, that they would send for this for the server down, uh, they wouldn't get through either. So I've sort of had to go back to the old way of just checking it uh, myself, which I did. The building uh, where the server is located, the Simcoe server, is about 40 miles uh, from where I live. Uh, I live near Burford, and the Simcoe server is in Simcoe, which is near the lake, Lake Erie, the North Shore of Lake Erie, just across the lake from uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio. But um, the next thing I did was call uh, their building just to make sure the building wasn't was there. Uh, thinking then the next thing would be uh, if fire destroyed the building or something. Although that's not likely either. Uh, but the phone rang, so that was good. It was still early in the morning; they weren't open yet. Uh, but it came back on in about 45 minutes. So it was just some maintenance they apparently had been doing uh, on the weekend, uh, not during business hours and so on. Uh, and before their technical support opened up as well, they well timed it. But it was a brief thing, and as expected, people, uh, as my email actually was down too because it's on the same server, and whether some emails bounced or not that arrived during that approximately 45 minutes or not, I don't know. But people began writing immediately what happened. Uh, it, there is a tendency that to think the worst, that if you get a... a, a the dreaded page not found, some people leaped to the conclusion that we're not going to be there anymore. And that's the nature of the internet is such that servers do go down, or uh, sometimes they're rebooted, sometimes there's just something required to be done for maintenance, uh, which require the server to be offline for, for a time, a brief time hopefully, uh, or something, um, some of the hardware connecting up to the server, the server itself might be alright. But my point is, when that happens, uh, don't think the worst, uh, because as I've said many times, I have no intention of ever stopping daily Bible study. I intend to do it until the day I die, unless I get really sick or something and I can't do it, but I have no health problems now. I'm 54, uh, relatively a young 54. I don't see much difference between 54 and 24, really, as far as health goes, and uh, I don't intend to ever stop doing this. But there will come a time as well, and this sort of gets into my question of the week, which I actually ask, I'm asking myself, but it's a generalized, it's a summation of questions uh, that come in along, along that line. Uh, you know, there may come a time in the end time, I'm not saying we're in the end time, but if it does come, servers are going to be shut down. You know, people who preach the truth are going to be shut down. There won't be any accident, and there won't be maintenance. You know, and again, it's the reason that people have to learn, first of all, to understand from prophecy that such time is coming in which people are going to be cut off and from each other not from the word of God and that's that's my point if you stand on the word of God you know you've always got your Bible you've always got the things that you count on first and foremost and that's the word of God and if you wish to have daily Bible study you can download the, the studies and sermons which brings me to another point we are replacing the CD I've been actually at 
working away at that for about a year now. This one I actually intended to do it. Again, for the reasoning that it's much... There's some places in the world we can't mail the CDs. People want them. Can't get them because they are non-Christian countries and hostile. So, though, whereas a download they would be able to do, but, and so a lot more people will be able to obtain the Daily Bible Study Library download, which will have the studies, not the sermons, because we found that... Um, sermons do not compress very much and they're already there anyway they're very easy to get whereas the studies themselves uh, it's not easy to download everything that's there 4100 or 4200 or whatever it is now to find them all and just download them easily in one easy shot as you can do with the sermons so that will be the download the entire all the studies all the maps all the graphics all the everything that will be in a single download and it, it'll be in HTML pages do uh, compress very nicely, and it'll be a, you won't need any special software. We're using the default zip uh, program that has been on uh, Windows-based computers for the last eight or ten years. You know, if you've got a ten-year-old computer, Windows computer, it will still work for you, and you can just expand it on your own computer, and then you'll have everything. It'll allow a lot more uh, quicker updates to the to the daily Bible study library as well rather than uh, what it takes for the CDs. So it's something we want to take online which rather than mailing it's just the, the efficiency we can deliver much faster obviously uh, and as well as in some places some countries as I said you can mail them and they won't get there. They simply won't. Uh, postal workers in whatever country it is will see anything with Bible on it on the label and they will throw in the trash that has happened. There are some countries and other countries have security problems, big security problems with their postal systems where mail just will not get there. It'll be stolen. Whereas a zip file on a download, uh, the security is much better. People can can do it. We'll simply send a link in an email and they can download from that link. So it's just a much easier and much quicker and much more efficient way. I'm still working on it. It's still not on yet. I am still working away at it. Uh, hopefully I'm, it's going to be on fairly soon and the CD set will be replaced with that. But it'll be that everything will still be there, available. Uh, the studies uh, in a single zip and the sermons as they already are. So it'll be a much easier, much simpler, and much faster way. But again, uh, as I said, if you have to learn to count on the Word of God first because you don't have to worry about the Internet. If you've got a Bible, unless you've got an internet Bible, well then, you know, maybe you should have a paper Bible as well. They're nice to have too. And, you know, you can go to a, a bookstore, they're not expensive all that much. You can get a lot of uh, expensive Bibles, you know, family heirloom Bibles and things. I mentioned too uh, that you should be wearing out Bibles. The one exception, I mentioned that in a sermon, I think last week, two weeks ago. The one exception to that, of course, is a family heirloom Bible, a fr family tradition Bible where family records and things like that. Certainly you don't want to wear that out. But I'm just talking about a regular reading Bible. Uh, you you can get them uh, for a few dollars, or even just on your own computer, where you don't have to depend on the internet. I don't expect the internet's going to be gone. I mean, I don't. We don't see anything like that coming, at least in the immediate future. But you know, blackouts can happen. We had a blackout uh, here in southern Ontario, which affected. Actually, it started in I believe Ohio two years ago, and it took down a blackout in. On uh, Ohio, uh, I think Pennsylvania, New York, uh, over in Michigan, because the power grids connected. There was some problem with a, a generator in Ohio, and it went down, and the cascade effect put, took us, took everything down. And it was like three or four days where everything was down. That was our longest uh, time that we've ever been down. And people just did the best they could. But people understood what was going on there in that case. But that was the only time we've ever been down. That was the only time I've ever missed a study publishing in, in 12 or 13 years, although uh, they were written, they were ready to load, and the ones that were on the server were on the server, but the server had no power. There's a backup generator, but that can only last for a while either, and if everything else is down, uh, it's down. So it's just a matter of learning to stand on the Word of God, to look to it, and if you've got that in your hand, you don't have to worry about an outside source. And as far as daily Bible study is concerned, uh, my suggestion is download the sermons. Uh, even if you have dial-up, you know, you can just click on right-click, save as, download it to your computer when you're doing something else. You don't have to sit and wait for it. You know, just let it go and go do whatever it is you're doing, and, you know, you don't have the sensation of waiting. You know, if you have an unlimited dial-up account, 
uh, you can do that. And most can be downloaded in an hour. Actually, when I first began from where I live in the country, I had to load them, upload them to the server with dial-up. So it's, you know, it's not something I haven't done, too. It's the same thing. It's a high-speed wireless. We use a high-speed wireless connection now, but at the first it was a um, dial-up. So it's, not, it's quite doable. It's no problem at all. And, you know, get them onto your computer. And the same thing, uh, as I said, with the library, the down, library download for the studies, that will hopefully be on fairly soon. I'm not going to put a deadline on it, but I'm just, just saying it is coming for sure. So, And the CDs will be replaced. So, When blackouts happen, uh, when you happen to click on Daily Bible Study some morning and see the dreaded page not found, uh, it's not because we're not here because somebody is doing some maintenance or perhaps uh, some other problem that will be fixed. It's not going to be very f for very long. So no need to get excited, uh, you know, if you have your own Bible, because that's what you should be looking at first anyway, isn't it? It's the Word of God. We're merely studying the Word of God. We're not the Word of God. It's a matter of priorities. Get excited if somebody takes your Bible from you. Then you should get excited. You know, if, if there were anybody starts doing that, but if you happen to find a, a website down for a couple hours, uh, that's no need to worry too much about that. Here's a savior for the lost ones. Gaza has made the news relatively recently in the latest war there. The retaliation of the Palestinians or Hezbollah or whoever was doing it were firing rockets into Israel. And the Israelis finally had enough and they responded. Now, certainly no one disputes their legitimate right to defend themselves and to return fire. Somebody fires on them. Uh, what they have got a lot of criticism for was the overwhelming response the amount of firepower that Israel has been given, they certainly unleashed a lot of it. And a lot of things that were not supposed to be used, such as white phosphorus, which is intended primarily to be a battlefield illuminant or to set up smoke screens. It's not intended to rain fire upon people's heads because it, it inflicts very nasty burns. So without getting into all of that, we're just as the perspective of Gaza again knowing 
the wrath from the sky. And they also have known the wrath from a, a different sort of wrath from the sky as well, as we'll get to. But Gaza is an interesting study, and it's somewhat more complex if you take one of the words that actually mean the same place, because in the Hebrew it's pronounced Aza, and most people think of Gaza. If they get a, a concordance, they'll look up Gaza and totally ignore Aza. In perhaps some Bible translations, I didn't check that, perhaps they do translate it as Gaza. But if you look at the three references to Aza in the Bible, meaning Gaza, whereas there's 18 in, written as Gaza, but if you look at the ones of Aza, they cover a lot of ground, and they actually should be read as background in any study of Gaza. And we'll do that now. We'll just cover those three because they cover a tremendous amount of ground. And they help to understand, give us understanding of just what exactly was going on in the other references. Because if you look at Gaza from that name, you can understand that they've known the trouble that they see today for a very, very long time from very many different people. But consider this. Here's the first one, Deuteronomy 2, 21-23, A people great and many and tall as the Anakims, but the Lord destroyed them bef before them. And they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. And he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horims from before them. And they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead even unto this day. And the Avims, which dwelt in Hazarim, even unto Aza, the Kaphtorims, which came forth out of Kaphtor, destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. So people have been, and this is among the non-Israelite people, it's got nothing to do with Israel here, the killing, and who was, who was doing the killing? Who was raining the fire on them? Just read that very plainly what was happening there, because the Lord decides who lives where. And that included, apparently, if you want to read this, that includes even the non-Israelite people. But, at the same time, you have to understand that what they are there, if you take a longer view are future children of God, the same as everybody else, including all those nations. And including, as we'll get to here, many people think of them as the enemies of God, sort of because when the promise, uh, when God's chosen people entered the promised land, all those Canaanite people were, be, were to be driven out. And that's true. But, you know, that only held true for as long as the chosen people obeyed the Lord. When they didn't, they faced the very same wrath the very same extermination, if you will. And we'll read this from the Word of God, from Aza, the, the references there. Because if you look only at Gaza, you can get this perspective that somehow, well, there was Israel, and there was Gaza, and they were just sort of this righteous battle between the two of them. And of course, the righteous one always being the people of Israel. But they weren't. They wouldn't have been sent off into captivity if they were. They were just not free to do whatever they pleased whenever they got stronger than the so-called enemy. But consider here, 1 Kings 4, 21-25, the second reference to Azza. And Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river, unto the land of the Philistines, and unto the border of Egypt. And they brought presents and served Solomon all the days of his life. And Solomon's provision for one day was thirty measures of fine flour, and three score measures of meal, ten fat oxen, and twenty oxen out of the pastures, and an hundred sheep, beside hearts, and roebucks, and fallow deer, and fatted fowl. For he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river, from Tifsa even unto Aza, over all the kings on this side of the river, and he had peace on all sides round about him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. And notice there, every man under his vine and fig tree, that's a future we read of that in Micah, don't we? After the swords and plowshares. Because, you know, it's sort of applied to, King, to Solomon. He was a man of peace. You know, the reason he was given to build the temple, rather than David, who was alive, was David was a warrior, whereas Solomon was a man of peace. And not because he made the peace himself. It's, it was his father who made that peace. It was his father who conquered all the enemies and handed Solomon peace. You know, David was the peacemaker. Solomon grew from that, his kingdom, for all the way from the Euphrates to Uzzah. And you notice there's no mention of war there. He lived in peace, didn't he? He didn't annihilate them. He didn't do anything. And they apparently didn't do anything either. So there's sort of two extremes there, isn't it? You think of it. And but what happened with Solomon? He became corrupt, didn't he? He began worshipping idols. He became as pagan as the pagan peoples of those other nations. The whole area became corrupt. The whole region became corrupt. 
And you notice here from the reference to where it says Solomon ruled all the way from the river, and that's referring to the Euphrates, all the way to Aza. So that's to the Mediterranean coast. He ruled over that entire area. Well, what happened when Solomon became corrupt and the whole area became corrupt with him? What happened? The wrath was coming, wasn't it? But just read this one now. Jeremiah 25, 15-26. Again, the third and final reference to Azza. Consider. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad, because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took the cup at the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me, to wit Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof and the princes thereof to make them a desolation and astonishment and hissing and a curse as it is to this day. Pharaoh king of Egypt and his servants and his princes and all his people and all the mingled people and all the kings of the land of Uz and all the kings of the land of the Philistines and Ashkelon, and Azza, and Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod. And just to interject there, those are the five major Philistine cities. Azza, or Gaza, was one of them. Continuing, Edom, and Moab, and the children of Ammon, and the kings of Tyrus, and the kings of Zidon, and the kings of the isles which are beyond the sea, Dedan, and Teman, and Buz, and all that are in the utmost corners, and all the kings of Arabia, and all the kings of the mingled people that dwell in the desert, and the kings of Zimri, and the kings of Elam, and the kings of the Medes, and the kings of the north, far near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world, which are upon the face of the earth, and the king of Shishak shall drink after them, and the king of Sheshach, S-H-E-S-H-A-C-H, as the King James has it, refers to the king of Babylon. The references to him directly parallel it doesn't say Babylon there, but that's who he's describing, because the wrath was coming from the king of Babylon. And who was it coming on? All those nations of which Israel and Judah, at that time the southern kingdom, was just one. So it wasn't a matter of just, here was this struggle between right and wrong, black and white, where Israel was always right and the people of Gaza were always wrong, because there was a time when they faced the Lord's wrath together. And that's something that's ignored, or not well aware of a lot of people mind and again because if you don't look at the original word even as it's been translated depends on the bible translation i haven't checked them all but in this case aza if you don't read that you sort of might just miss the point of just there is this distinction that it isn't a matter who you are it's a matter of whether you obey the lord or not so the people of gaza aren't evil they're not worthless they're not just to be wasted they are people who one day may be just as much children of God, depending on their choice, as anyone else. Because when the time came in which they were all disobedient, they all faced God's wrath. Imagine a scene in which you can see the people of Gaza and the people of Judah being bombed together by the Lord. And that's what happened here. And all the other nations around it, all the way up to Tyre and Sidon, over into Egypt, over into Arabia. The king of Babylon came and he conquered that entire area. So it's a little bit of background there and it's important to understand this this myth that somehow the people of Gaza are, are evil or somehow they're just always on the other side because they're not. Because during the time of Solomon when he was righteous they were at peace with Israel living in peace with Israel and were blessed within Solomon's kingdom with Israel. And again, you can look forward to the kingdom of God. Even the reference there under his own vine and fig tree, as we read in 1 Kings 4.25, that's a direct reference to the future. Swords and plowshares and, and every man under his vine and fig tree. One of the most famous verses of the Bible. And it was a direct prophecy of the coming kingdom of God in which all those nations were peace. But when they became corrupt together, they faced the Lord's wrath together. Gaza and Judah together. So, important point before we begin our study of Gaza, which we'll now do. Gaza is one of the most ancient cities, and keeping in mind as well, Gaza, there is the city and there is the, the Gaza Strip, that area, the entire area known as Gaza, but primarily we're talking about the city here. It's one of the earliest, mentioned very early in Genesis, Genesis 10, 6 to 20, 
and it was settled by the descendants of Ham. And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim, and to interject there, Mizraim is Egypt. It's another name for Egypt. So the Egyptians and the people of Gaza have the same ancestry. As do, continuing, and Foot and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba and Havilah, and Sabta and Ramah, and Sabteka, and the sons of Ramah, Sheba and Didam. And Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erek, Ekad, Kalna, in the land of Shinar. And just to interject there, the, that family line of Ham settled both directions. It settled into Egypt, which is sometimes also known as the land of Ham. The Canaanite peoples, and, and specifically a specific branch of them, were the people of Gaza. And then in the other direction were, many of them, the people from Babylon. And keeping in mind later on, the ancestry meaning that does not include many of the Arab people because they were descendants later on of the other branch of Abraham's family. Put the link on for Abraham was not a Jew. He was an ancestor of, of the Jews, but he was also an ancestor of a lot of the Arab people. If you know, if Abraham comes back today, or when he comes back, it's going to happen. He's going to look at the people, and here the Muslim people are going to be claiming, or the Arab people primarily, are going to be claiming him as an ancestor. The people of Judah are going to be claiming him as an ancestor. The people of the rest of the tribes are going to be claiming him as an ancestor, and they're all going to be right, because that's what he was. He was the father of many nations. But at this time, this is way back. This is talking very early Genesis 10. Continuing, verse 11, And out of that land went forth Athshur, and built Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth, and Kalna. And to interject there, that's the Assyrian Empire, up in the northern part of Babylon. And, of course, later on, those empires, uh, Assyria peaked. Uh, it was the one that conquered the northern ten tribes of Israel. Uh, it then declined, and to the power of the Babylonians, who were the ones who took the southern people of Judah, as we read in the earlier part, that king who was come in there not just to punish Judah, as we read, but all those nations in there, everybody, including the people of Gaza. They all felt the brunt of it. The brunt of the power of Babylon has sent and directed to do so by the Lord. And there were other times the Lord did it directly himself. Continuing, and risen between Nineveh and Kalna, the same as a great city. And Mizram begat Ludim and Anamim, and Lahabim, Naphtahim, and Pathrushim, and Kasluhim, out of whom came Philistim, and Kaphtorim, and Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvadite, and the Zemarite, and the Hamathite, and afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, even unto Lasha. Now just consider that. The border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, that's up in the north, Tyre and Sidon, that's up in what we would know today as Lebanon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza. So we're talking about the coastal strip from Lebanon on down to Gaza. That's what it's talking about there. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. So you can see there the family. I read, read through all of those. Not always easy, uh, some, the way some of those are read. Um, that plus, uh, you know, try reading an hour's worth of King James tongue twisters. The Old English, the way the sentences are structured sometimes is rather cumbersome. And keeping in mind as well, all those names, those were English transliterations from the original languages. It's, they're written in English as they sounded in the other languages, uh, using the other alphabets as well. So it's just an approximation. Because as we mentioned, even some of the best-known um, people of Bible history would not have recognized their names as we pronounce them. Moses, his actual name was Moshe. David was David, uh, Jerusalem is Jerusalem, and you know, so on, on and on and on. That's why, actually, why uh, in the future the whole world is going to get a new pure language. You know, it surely needs one. Joshua 10, 40 to 42. So Joshua smote all the country of the hills and of the south and of the vale and of the springs and all their kings. He left none remaining, but utterly destroyed all the breathe as the Lord God of Israel commanded. And Joshua smote them from Kadesh Barnea even unto Gaza, 
in all the country of Goshen, even unto Gibeon. And all these kings in their land did Joshua take at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. So it was actually the Lord fighting for them. But when they became disobedient, they became targets of the Lord's wrath, just the same as those other nations who fought against his people. Because by fighting against his people, they were actually fighting him. And that's why the Lord was fighting them. And just when Judah turned on the Lord, making themselves an enemy of the Lord, he fought them in the same way. As we read, it doesn't matter who you are, it's what you do. And that's the lesson. It's about truth, no matter who you are. Because, you know, God's truth applies to everybody. Everybody. No matter who you are. We're all going to be judged on what we've done. Joshua 11, 21 to 23 and you know, by the way, some people use the wrath that the Lord rained upon Gaza as their excuse to, to slaughter people of Gaza today. But that isn't what the basis of the Lord's wrath was upon them. It's not what it was about. And as we read, and as I'm trying to emphasize, the people of Judah faced that same wrath when they disobeyed him. And the people of Judah are going to face that same wrath when Christ returns because they are going to be among those who fight the Lord. And you're going to read, see... If you happen to be alive that day, I repeated what we read of how the Lord's wrath is going to come upon all the nations that fight Him, as in disobey Him. So, being the chosen people means obeying Him. That makes you the chosen people. Physical ancestry means nothing when it comes to being obedient to the Lord and being God's true chosen people. Because ultimately, that's what it means. Joshua eleven twenty one to 23, and it and at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains, from Hebron, from Deber, from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod there remain. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes, and the land rested from war. And isn't it interesting, the Lord was fighting with Joshua, as in fighting for Joshua. The Lord completed through Joshua the taking of the land, but what does it say? There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath and Ashdod there remained. And then there was peace. So the people of Gaza, the non-Israelite people of Gaza, lived there then in peace, and they were left alone as if it was their home. And isn't that interesting? Because originally, you know, it was. It was their original territory, as we read very early in Genesis. They existed long before Israelites did. Joshua 15.1 This then was the lot of the tribe of the children of Judah by their families, even to the border of Edom, the wilderness of Zin, southward was the uttermost part of the south coast. And that continues down the description of the Allocation of the tribal lands. This is for Judah. Continuing, Joshua 15:45-47. Ekron with her towns and her villages, from Ekron even unto the sea, all that lay near Ashdod with their villages, Ashdod with her towns and her villages, Gaza with her towns and her villages, unto the river of Egypt and the great sea and the border thereof. So it was included within the land of Israel, specifically within the tribe of Judah. Judges 1, 1 to 2. Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And then it continues on. And this, keeping in mind, this is talking about the early, the southern part of the land. It was natural for Judah to do the fighting because it was their territory. They had to fight for what was theirs. Continuing, Judges 1, 18, 19. Also Judah took Gaza with the coast thereof, and Ashkelon with the coast thereof, and Ekron was the coast with the coast thereof. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drave out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron. And that's talking about Gaza. So you can see Gaza has been a military challenge for the people of Judah since very, very early times. And it's interesting there, they had chariots of iron, uh, did they get them from their cousins over in Egypt? Could be. It would seem to be. Judges 16, 1 to 4, one of the most famous people of the Bible, Samson, had a fondness for visiting Gaza. 
Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her and it was told the Gazites saying Samson is, is come hither and they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night saying in the morning when it is day we shall kill him and Samson lay till midnight and rose it at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them bar and all and put them on his shoulders and carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron and to interject there that's quite a number of miles from Hebron to Gaza or Gaza to Hebron dragging a the city gate and the door and everything else so exactly why he wanted to do that anyway he did it and he got away with his life they set him up but Gaza was not done with Samson because Samson wasn't done with Gaza he went back verse 4 and it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman of the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah and of course that was going to be trouble this time he would not escape Judges 16 21 to 31 but the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven and put the link on for why there was nothing magical as some people think about his hair he was a Nazarite put the link on for that study continuing then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for an, for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their god and to rejoice for they said our god hath delivered Samson our enemy into our hand and when the people saw him they praised their god for they said our god hath delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country which slew many of us and it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said call for Samson that he may make us sport and they called for Samson out of the prison house and made them sport and they set him between the pillars so to interject there he'd been blinded he was in chains they sort of made him dance around like a clown for their amusement continuing verse 26 and Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth that I may lean upon them now the house was full of men and women and all the lords of the Philistines were there and there were upon the roof about three thousand men and women that beheld while Samson made sport and Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand, and of the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein so the dead which he slew at his death were more than which he slew in his life and then his brethren and all the houses of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtual in the burying place of Manoah his father and he judged Israel twenty years it's interesting uh, Samson took a lot of life in his life uh, he killed three thousand at the end uh, and perhaps thousands before that time mostly with his bare hands keeping in mind back then the weaponry they had not maybe a bow and a sword and that's it so he was a man who battled practically single-handedly the people of Gaza and they finally got him 1 Samuel 6 17 to 21 and 7 1 and these are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord for Ashdod one, for Gaza one, for Ashkelon one, for Gath one, for Ekron one. And I'll stop there just to explain there. Imrods is an incorrect translation by the King James. It should be tumors because they had taken, captured the Ark of the Covenant. They held it in Gaza and, and along through the other Philistine cities in there. And the Lord sent mice in there and caused plague, bubonic plague and that's the tumors that they're talking about there they wanted to get send the ark home is what they wanted and that's another reason why for example uh, as we explained in the study Raiders of the Lost Ark why no one could have the ark today there are many fanciful ideas the the lost ark is it's in Ethiopia or it's in Jer anywhere a lot of all these different places it can't be there's only one place it can be and that's where the Levites the specific Levites who had possession of it or who were ordered to have possession of it ordered to by the Lord the only place it can be is where they left it 
And that's under the Temple Mount, as explained in that study. Raiders of the Lost Ark, continuing now just to explain. And also, as it'll explain here, what happens when people looked into the Ark, when it was returned to the Israelites, but who took it upon themselves, who were Israelites who were not authorized, looked into it, what happened. And we'll just see who felt the Lord's wrath. Again, continue. And the golden mice, according to the number of the, all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both of fenced cities and of country villages, even unto the great stone of Abel, whereupon they set down the ark of the Lord, which stone remaineth unto this day in the field of Joshua the Beth Shemite. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh, because they looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people fifty thousand and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented, because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. Now, who's that talking about? Just to stop there. Beth Shemesh? Is that now still the Philistines? No, the people of the Philistines, they felt the Lord's wrath. Bubonic plague was sent upon them. So they sent the, the ark back to the Israelites. But, what happened? Continuing, and the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God, and to whom shall he go up from us? And they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kirith Jerim, saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down and fetch it up to you. And the men of kirith Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And we'll put the link on for the lines of the Levites who were able to do that. And, you know, it's it's an amazing thing how people sort of ignore such plain historical accounts of why the Lord's wrath came upon people and how the Lord's wrath came upon the so-called chosen people when they behaved in a way that defied the definition of chosen people. Because chosen people doesn't mean we are God's people, we can just do as we please, sort of if like God's people become a God people unto themselves. And that's what they did, both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. It doesn't mean that. Israel learned the hard light way, the folly of that arrogance. Because it isn't a matter of who you are, or where you are, or what nation you are. It's a matter of living in peace with the Lord's law. And the only time the Lord fought against those other nations, nations is when they fought against his people, when his people were obedient to him. When his people failed to continue being obedient to him, they felt the Lord's wrath as much as the people who were previously fighting against them. See the point? And that and it helps to understand that Gaza, the people of Gaza, are not the enemy of God. They're not some more hopelessly lost outcasts. If they turn to the Lord they will have peace. And you know that applies just as much to the people of Judah today as it does to the people of Gaza. They are in the same boat in the Lord's eyes because both of them reject Christ equally, don't they? One is merely mostly Muslim, the other is Christian rejecting people of Judah, neither one of which accept Christ. So when the Lord comes, which one is going to feel his wrath? Or both? And the answer is both. And that's the reason why. They can't simply claim to be, we are the chosen people, and by the way, we reject Christ. It doesn't work that way, does it? You can't be his chosen people if you reject him. And that applies to anybody. And ultimately, in the end, it will apply to everyone equally. There is no favorites. The Lord doesn't play favorites. He used certain people, certain nations, to become the source from which the Messiah would come. But he had to be somebody. There's no reason, you know, if the Lord's will had been such, Christ could have been from somebody from Gaza if he chose to do so. Because Christ had to be of some nation. Or he could have been one of the Arab people because they're, they're descendants of Abraham directly. But the Lord chose a particular line. But Christ is the Messiah of all people. And I again emphasize right now, today, both the people of Gaza and the people of Judah reject him just as much, one as the other. So how can either one be the chosen people? They can't, can they? Although, some of them are. There are Christians in Gaza, and there are Christians among the people of Judah. Therefore, they are the Christian chosen people. 
Do you see the point? The enemy are those who reject Christ, no matter who they are, including among the so-called chosen people. Consider Gaza's mention in Acts, the only mention of it in the New Testament, but the lesson of it. Acts 8, 25-39, And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And to interject there, Samaritans were, ironically, looked down upon by the people of Judah as being inferior, second-rate. They'd been brought in when the northern tribes were taken away into captivity because they disobeyed the Lord. The Assyrians brought in the Samaritans, people, foreign peoples, to settle the land. And when the people of Judah, the southern kingdom, returned, the Samaritans were still up there, and they were looked down upon for that reason. Oh, you're foreigners. We're the chosen people. You're just foreigners. But consider, you know, if you look at the Samaritans, they accepted, many of them accepted Christ, while his own people crucified him, or had him crucified. So what was the lesson there? Were the Samaritans becoming the chosen people? Well, they were if they accepted Christ, and many of them did, just as many of the people of Judah did. You know, most of the first Christians were Jews, but most of the people who rejected Christ were, by the very definition, also Jews, because no one else cared. You know, atheists didn't reject Christ. The Romans didn't reject Christ. They killed him, but only uh, as a matter of politics. They viewed him as a political threat, not a religious one. But Christ rejected who? Who did he reject? Those who rejected him. And only after those who knew better. That's why he also said, Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. They can be forgiven as long as they don't know. But continue. Verse 26, referring to Gaza. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, and come to Jerusalem for to worship. Now the principle there is applying to a man from Ethiopia, because Gaza was in the, in the route from, from Africa on the way to Jerusalem. So it's a popular, it's a direct travel route in there. But the principle, here was a man, a foreigner, non-Israelite, who the Lord sent a preacher of the truth to help brighten the light that was beginning to flicker within him by means of the Holy Spirit. didn't matter where he was. He didn't say, don't go anywhere near Gaza. Don't go anywhere near those people who are not the chosen people. Because, ironically, they were the chosen people. This man from Ethiopia became one of the chosen people by accepting the Christ. Continue. Verse 28 was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to his to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, saying, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, that he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so open he gnawed his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet this, of himself, or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, and began at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So what's the lesson there? It's not a matter of who you are or where you're from. It's whether or not you accept Christ when the Spirit is there enabling you to. And that applies to who today? Because, you know, you can go to Gaza, as I said, or you can go to Jerusalem today. Generally speaking, 
and find the same rejection of Christ. Or the same acceptance among a minority because there's Christians in Gaza and there's Christians in Jerusalem. True Christians in Gaza, true Christians in Jerusalem. Although they're still very much in a minority. I've heard from some of both. So I know they're there, but for the most part they're rejected. So do you see who's the enemy then? Well, certainly somebody sending rockets into your country, that's the enemy. Or sending phosphorus down on children's heads, that can be viewed as the enemy. But apart from that, because the Lord will judge, we don't have to concern ourselves with it, although we'd be less than human to not be saddened by the sight of such things we see in the news and read of it. But you see the point? There are Christians today in both Gaza and in Judah. And there are unbelievers yet in Gaza and in Judah equally. One is no better than the other. One is no worse than the other. They're the same and that principle applies to the whole world. There is no difference. So the point of this sermon what I've been trying to lead to by explaining this is that those who look as Israel being the good guys or those who look at the people of Gaza being the good guys depending what part of the world is it's viewed that way the dividing line should not be politics or race or nations but only that Christ whether or not he will be accepted when the time comes because you know the war that's going on today, the people who've killed each other may one day wake up, literally, and in the resurrection, and find that they were both deceived, and may well both be Christians. People killing each other who may one day be brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. Native-born citizens of the kingdom of God. And then, imagine, they'll look back at the atrocities they've committed upon one another, and think what complete fools they were for not being able to see beyond their own carnality. Because if you do that, you can realize just how carnal and worthless wars like that really are. They settle nothing in the long run. They do nothing in the long run except cause a lot of misery to people who will one day be family. Thank you for joining us for services this week. As always, your being with us makes our joy complete. Until next week when we meet again on this, God's holy Sabbath day, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you all. Able to save.